everyone, and welcome to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder, best-selling author and senior director of valuation services at CFGI. I help my clients figure out what their businesses are worth and what their intellectual property assets are worth. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about me or schedule a conversation, you can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. In the finance world, business performance and business value is measured by the numbers, but savvy leaders understand that the numbers don't always tell the story. So this is the program where we dig a little deeper to understand what really matters most in business. Today we're going to be talking about issues that businesses face from the lens of a battle-tested CFO. And I'm pleased to welcome my guest today, Glenn Hartenbaum, who's the Chief Financial Officer of Gemini Bakery Equipment. Glenn, welcome to Behind the Numbers. Thank you, Dave. I always ask my guests to just tell the audience a little bit about who they are, and uh, then we'll dive in. Okay, well I started my career um, with a national CPA firm, still have my CPA license, and after that I've spent the rest of my career with a variety of middle market companies, first as a financial planning and analysis manager, then up through the controller role to the chief financial officer role. So I've worked in different industries um, from food manufacturing, retailing, insurance brokerage, and then I spent 15 years with a company called Saxco International where we were a distributor of glass bottles and related packaging, mostly sold to the alcoholic beverage industry. And that company was um, run by two brothers for a good part of the time that I was there. We grew by both acquisition and organically doubling the size of the business and then sold to private equity. So I had about six years of private equity experience with them as well. Continue to do acquisitions. In fact, during that time, you even helped me with an acquisition that we had, which I certainly appreciated. And my role there, as with many CFOs, encompassed not just accounting and finance, but also human resources and information technology. And then for the last two years, I've been with Gemini Bakery Equipment Company. And Gemini is a leading manufacturer and assembler of custom and semi-custom bakery equipment. Now what that means is that we'll sell ovens, proofers, but also equipment that will handle ingredients like flour and also dough and to make rolls and bread and we'll sell them both to commercial bakeries, commissary schools, but we'll also sell them to large industrial bakeries. And you know, we sell throughout North America. And my role there is similar, it's privately held, um, accounting, finance, human resources, information technology, but in terms of where CFOs have to wear different hats, I also have a very able um, vice president that reports to me so that I have certain purchasing and sales administration that also falls under me. Yeah, and we're going to talk about the different hats that CFOs wear ultimately as we move into the conversation. But I want to start with the topic that centers around the speed of business, Glenn. Business moves at, at a very fast pace. Uh, oftentimes decisions have to be made very quickly, uh, but there are times where decisions need to be made more thoughtfully. And sometimes doing nothing is as good as doing something. Um, I know you've got a perspective on each of those three. Why don't you share that with the audience, please? Sure, and I guess I'll say there's three thoughts that I have on that topic because I think a lot about decision and, and risk. And the first one is, you know, sometimes it is better to wait. The second one I'm going to contradict myself was it's better to make a quick decision and get it out of the way. And the third one we'll talk about after you make the decision and trying to make it the best decision. Yeah, those are great. And, and by the way, for our viewers, this, you know, Glenn's giving our perspective here from the lens of the CFO, but what you're going to be sharing here is a conversation that can be had anywhere in an organization. So with that okay. backdrop, dive in. So the first one is in terms of waiting. I guess about five, six years ago, I read a book that was called Wait, the Art and Science of Delay. I think it's written by a gentleman named you know, Partnoy. And the subtitle of the book was Don't Just Do Something, Stand There. And it was really a, a fun book to read. And he gave a lot of analogies, including a baseball player, that when the pitch is coming in, if you wait that extra couple milliseconds to detect the spin, you're going to be a better hitter. And he talked about, in certain cases, um, holding off on making a decision. And what I really took away from that is, especially for bigger decisions, it's really waiting until the time is ripe um, in terms of making that decision. And in some cases, it can be as simple, especially when you're a CFO, sometimes you're the one that has to be you know, the non-emotional, rational one. And when a crisis hits, you sometimes don't want to react. And something as simple as saying, let's sleep on it, let's the cooler heads prevail, let's reflect, we can make a decision the next morning. Um, in some cases, um, I'm thinking of a lot of negotiations that we'll go through with contracts where I get heavily involved, where you're looking at provisions to the contract. And while maybe a contract would be okay, it's one we could live with in terms of the risk that you're bearing and the obligations we have to lead. If I have a little bit of a concern and I ever hear the phrase from um, one of the people that we're negotiating with, I don't know why that provision's there. It's like, well, I'd rather wait to find out why. And if it's not that person, we'll be like, we'll wait to find out why. 
your money or save some expenses. And I guess we can all but we all get blistered with emails. And whether you're a CFO of a company or any manager, the further up you are, people will always send you emails or CC emails. As much as some of the advice is answer your emails as quickly as you can, get them out of your in inbox. Um, and I certainly don't keep thousands of emails in my inbox. I'd rather wait because in some cases, the problems will just go away on their own or more importantly, especially if I see that people on my team are copied, I want to see how they respond. Um, so it really lets me sort of test them to see whether they have the ability to resolve the problem on their own. And if it's something that's really critical, of course, I'll chime right in. Um, and I guess my last point on this, and I think with knowing the people that are you know, probably watching this show, is this is not an invitation to procrastination, but I don't think most of the folks that are watching this are going to procrastinate. It's making sure that a decision is made in its right time. Um, and it may not even just be making sure you're going to get more data. It's just making sure you think through things, that you've maybe thought to ask that extra question to get a better result. Yeah, good stuff. Glenn, for the folks watching, if they wanted to know more about you or get in contact with you, is there a way they can do that? Yeah, I think the best way to reach out to me is on LinkedIn. Okay, great. So. When you talk about allowing your team to respond to an email, that, that begs the question about leadership, right? Uh, and that's a very nuanced tactic that you employed there. Talk a little bit about empowering your team to, to make decisions like that. Well, first of all, as many people that know me, I think I'm a frustrated teacher, so I love when I have the opportunity to be able to train and develop others. And so many times people would come into my office, how do I resolve this, how do I fix this? And in some cases, I will literally have to bite my tongue to make sure I let them finish asking the question, first of all, and then secondly, to force myself to say, well, how would you resolve this issue? So it's mostly giving people the confidence to be able to, first of all, make sure they're thinking it through on their own, and if it's the right answer, you have the right answer. Go forth and get it done. And if I need to tweak it a little bit, we'll talk about that so I can help them make sure. Because I can never move on and do other things unless the team and the folks that report to me can sort of take on what I'm doing. Yeah, so it's been said that um, leadership is an awful lot like parenting, right? So <laughs> if you've got kids, sometimes you've got to let them learn their own lessons, make their own mistakes. But that requires a little bit of trust when you're talking about the business world. Yeah, oh. Absolutely, but I think that really gets back into hiring the right people. And also, you know, you, you test in little ways. I mean, I would never for, you know, a perfect example would be when we're acquiring a company, and this is very mundane again, but when you're dealing with how to record the acquisition and how to handle that, I would never throw one of my divisional controllers to the wolves on that. I'm going to be with them and certainly help them every step of the way to give them confidence, so whether it's an acquisition after that or the one after that, that they can then do it on their own. But when you see those sorts of things, you don't see them all the time. But in many cases, and we'll talk about this with the next point of decision making, if a decision isn't that big, the risk isn't that big. Make a decision, let them make the decision, how much of a mistake could they really make? And you learn from your mistakes. You've been involved in a number of things. In the, in the deal world, everything is predicated on speed. Get it done, get it done, get it done. Um, as you've gone through those transactions, have you been able to kind of modulate that decision making? Yeah, I think so, but I think it was helped in part because I was fortunate and that the two brothers that owned the company, and even when the private equity partners took over, they too had enough experience and enough wisdom to know that during due diligence, if there was an issue, it was never full speed ahead, we're going to get this deal done at any cost. There was always a level of rationality and cool-headedness that they had, and I learned from them to make sure that better to not do any deal than to do a bad deal. And typically, if, if two, um, you know, I guess I would say, um, honest ethical partners want to do a deal if it gets held up for a week or two weeks or even a month to be able to resolve an issue better to get it resolved the right way than to push something through because you set up a timetable when you first um, wanted to try to do a deal. Nice. I think we've got about two minutes or so to go in this first segment, Glenn. What keeps you up at night these days? Um, everything. I mean, <laughs> I'm <laughs> I mean, I'm a light sleeper, but I think that when you're a CFO, your role can be all-encompassing of um, you know, a lot of different things. I don't worry as much about the numbers because I know them, they're there. I think what I worry about are things that go beyond the numbers or behind the numbers, as you might say in this show. 
and I worry about the future in terms of sales and purchasing because I have a background in distribution and even with Gemini as a manufacturer, you always want to make sure that you're adding value because if you're not adding value to the equation, not only to your customer, but to your suppliers, you, know, you could very well get cut out of the business. So I think I always want to make sure that as we look ahead or what I think about is are we a company that has a vibrant future? And thankfully we do in my current role, but do we have a vibrant future? Um, in terms of always being able to add that value to our customers and to our suppliers. And the business world's always changing, so that equation's always changing. So you always have to try to you know, keep attuned to what might be coming down the road. Yeah, and I think we've got to take a commercial break okay. at this point. So we'll pick up on that after the break, uh, dive a little bit deeper into the different hats that you wear and what CFOs need to be thinking about. So don't go anywhere. We're going to pay a couple of quick bills, and we'll be right back on Behind the Numbers. Shelter dogs aren't broken. They've simply experienced more life. If they were human, we would call them wise. They would be the ones with tales to tell and stories to write. The ones dealt a bad hand who responded with courage. Do not pity a shelter dog. Adopt one. Say we've got grit and we'll take it as a compliment. Because it's our uncommon drive, our spark within, that brings us together and sets us apart. We are temple made. And when others take shortcuts, when others take breaks, when others take the easy way, we take charge. Add us on social media to watch bloopers, behind the scenes footage, previews, and more. I work 13 hours a day, six days a week. So when I'm off the clock, I gotta get stuff done. So when I need a snack, I need something healthy, tasty, and easy to eat. Like wonderful pistachios without the shells. They're protein powered, delicious, and great on the go. And that's perfect for me. Thanks, Liz. A woman without a lot of time. Whether you're a gourmet cook or just want to eat like one, visit Rostelli Market Fresh, your home for the freshest locally sourced ingredients to please everyone who loves great food. Our organic meats, quality seafood, and free-range poultry are cut fresh to order. Chefs create culinary-inspired prep foods made fresh every day, which pair nicely with our vast selection of fine wines and spirits. Choose from handmade pastas, artisan cheeses, organic produce, and grocery items, all from the finest purveyors. Rostelli Market Fresh, from our family to yours. RVN TV is a platform for people of any industry to share their story. Over 285,000 viewers are tuning in to RVN TV shows monthly. We guarantee a great experience that you'll be sharing with everyone you know while increasing your personal and company's brand awareness. But what is your brand? According to Forbes, it's a combination of your logo, your product, your design and feel, and your personality. Did you know that aside from being a guest, we offer even more opportunity to boost your brand? Adding your company logo and website on screen during your interview will allow viewers to recognize your brand instantly. Incorporating images and video clips is another great way to showcase your product during your live segment. Let viewers see how good you really are. And most importantly, there's you and your interview. For less than the cost of a newspaper, direct mail, or a magazine ad, you can leave our studio and within 48 hours have a permanent digital copy of your live segment to link to your social media, embed into your company website, or use in email marketing. Investing in your brand is so very important, and we can't wait to have you as a guest. Shelter dogs aren't broken. I'm Dave Bookbinder. Today we're talking with Glenn Hartenbaum, who's the Chief Financial Officer of Gemini Bakery Equipment Company. Glenn, I just want to close the loop on a, a topic that we talked about in the beginning of the first segment, which was the decision-making process. Uh, we talked about the speed of decision, but sometimes there's gray areas. And I, I know the most important thing in a decision is to try and do your best to get it right. So speak to that a little bit, if you would. 
Yeah, I think what I wanted to comment on was that you know, what struck me is that you know, when you make decisions, especially for larger areas, they're gray decisions. And when you go to make them, you can never go back in a time machine and understand, should I have taken a different path or made another decision? And when you look back on it, in some cases, it clearly was a good decision, clearly was a bad decision. If it's a bad decision, you know, the advice, which I think most people would know, is cut your losses, you know, you know, move on from it. But in some cases, you have a decision where it's up to you to determine whether it's the right decision or the wrong decision. And I'll give one personal example, one business example, you know, having had kids that one that's through college and one that's in it right now, when you're deciding between colleges, you, know, you can never really know which one do I want to go to. I mean, I advise my kids is once you pick the college, you can't go back. You can't sit there and say, oh, well, it was me. I should have gone to this school instead of that one. You're there. You, may, you, you picked it for certain reasons. Make it a place that's a good academic and, and um, fun environment for you. And in business, I can think of one example in my past at Saxco where we implemented a new ERP system and brought three different companies onto one platform. And it was really divided down the middle when we had our um, executive or business process team to determine which system to buy. About 40% wanted system A, 60% wanted system B. We made a decision. And after it was, done, it was done, it was a rocky implementation. And that often can happen. And you had a number of people that were upset, bemoaning it, saying, oh, we should have picked the other system. And I actually had a bit of a shading towards the system that we didn't pick. But I'm a leader in the company, and I knew that we picked a good system. So you pull people together, why isn't it working, and let people know this is a good system. There's thousands of other people that use it. We're going to make this right. And we found a good partner. We went back. We did a few changes to it. And when we look back another year later, it was a good system and I think supplied the business needs. So it's really a question of making your decision the right one after you make that decision. You said something that, that I, th I think is intriguing there. Um, you preferred another system, but you weren't wedded to it, or you were at least wise enough to understand that there's a greater good here. What happens in circumstances, whether it's deal mode or day-to-day -day mode, where there's a, a team perhaps involved in decision making and everybody's got their own horse in the race, they've got their own personal stake, and there's emotions involved, and it's hard to be objective. H how do you advise people handle that, especially in your role as the CFO, where you're the voice of reason in the room, ultimately, right? Yeah, and I, and I think probably it's easier for me because that's my default, and I think the default of many CFOs is to try to be that rational person, to try to be fact-based, to make sure when you're looking at different systems or just in a situation where there's a lot of voices in the room, to give people a chance to explain it. One of the most common things is to be a good listener and to make sure when someone says something to me to really you know, not think of what my answer is going to be, really listen to them and make sure I say back to them in my own language what they're saying in terms of the points that they make or why they think a certain course of action is right. Because first of all, when I'm going to say it'll be in a rational mode, it'll be fact-based, but in a way I'm advocating for them and I'm making sure that they felt heard. Yeah. And then once that's on the table, we can move on to other positions and then we can all sort of look at it, I hope, in a way that's a little bit more rational and come to the best decision for the company. And as you mentioned, in that situation on my own, I may have picked the other system. But um, while it's not a democracy, it's one where you want to try to pick what's best for the company. And in talking with the team, as we sort of laid it out there, I was convinced that the other system was the right one for the company. And it took us a little bit of pain and a little extra time to get there, but we did get there. Good stuff. Let's talk about the evolving role of the CFO and the many hats that you wear. In our, in our conversation so far, I've heard you mention that you've had responsibility for human resources, sales, uh, purchasing. Talk about the, the evolving role of the CFO and you know, what can our audience uh, take away in terms of how to deal with this expansion that's happening? Well, this part's probably, I'm going to say it's no secret to you know, many of the folks that are listening, but the days of where a CFO just sits in their cave and cranks out the numbers and takes care of cash flow and the finances, I think are long gone, um, especially as businesses move more quickly and as they get thinner at the top, it's natural that certain areas that I mentioned, information technology and even human resources will fall under the CFO, but in certain cases, you have other responsibilities that do as well. Like you mentioned in my current role, um, reporting up through an ER, you know, purchasing and, and sales administration. And to me, it's kind of fun. I've always enjoyed the operations. And one of the things I think about, especially in businesses that I've been in, you know, if you think of my past again, when you're a financial person or an accountant, your toolkit's kind of portable. I mean, you can go to many different industries. And so when I land into a role 
Um, I've usually seen um, a lot of different industries, whereas my depth of knowledge in where I'm currently working is not as great as my fellow managers. They know the business, but they don't have the same perspective that I do. And so I can be a person that can give a little bit of that outside perspective. So I think about that. And also as my hair gets a little bit grayer, what I realized is that um, when people come into my office just to ask questions, you know, Glenn, just as a, as a businessman's perspective, how do you think you should deal with this? They just want to talk for a bit. And, you know, whereas at first my natural default might be to say, oh, geez, they're in the way. I got to finish this budget or I got to get this analysis done. I want to dig into these numbers. Yes, that's important and that's part of my job. But my job is really to help my fellow team members, not only um, the people that report to me, my peers that are managers, and even people that report to them. So to the extent I'm more embedded in the operations and understand it, I can be more helpful. I will never understand the business and the roles as well as the people that are coming into my office. But again, I have a bit of that outside perspective. Maybe I can frame it in a different way. And part of the fun is I learn from it too because they're going to tell me things about the business that I don't know. That's great. And that's a wonderful perspective that you have in, in the idea that it's, it's about building your team and uplifting them because it's getting everybody rowing in the same direction. How's technology uh, evolved and impacted the role of the CFO and where do you see that headed? Well, I mean, I think that in the middle market, one of the challenges is a, there's a lot of great tools and toys out there, but do you have the money to really be able to implement all of that? But even within financial constraints, there are always ways you can look to try to do things more efficiently in terms of working mobily, which has allowed us to keep employees perhaps that we would have to terminate that are in remote locations. It's a lot easier to integrate them into the operation and keep them on board because um, both through acquisitions, we've acquired people in different, um, you know, locales and it's a really good person, well, they can work out of their home. Um, and I think we're always looking for ways to be able to provide information more quickly and the right information more quickly, where it would take weeks to be able to dig into data and parse it. We can now do it within a couple hours. And we're not as good as we can be. And I'm sure there's a lot of other companies that are listening and saying, Glenn, hours, boy, we can get the data in, you know, half an hour. Hopefully we'll get there someday too. Yeah. Glenn, for those who are watching who would like to pick your brain and get in contact with you, how can they do that? So the best way is on LinkedIn. I'm happy to have people reach out to me. They can just message me. That sounds good. Thank you. Um, we have about five minutes to go in, in the program here. Time definitely goes very quickly here and behind the numbers. I want to talk a little bit about networking. Uh, in my day-to-day, -day, I've, I've um, tried to help a lot of in-transition executives. Um, a number of them have been CFOs. And there's kind of a recurring theme that I've observed where CFO day-to-day, -day, they're very busy, head down. Uh, and maybe not so active in networking. And then something will happen, their company will be acquired, relocation, downsize, what have you. Uh, and now they find themselves needing to be networked. Um, can you give any advice to the folks who are watching about the, the value of networking? Well, I guess the first thing, Dave, is yeah, it's very easy. It's the natural default, I think, of, I don't want to stereotype CFOs, but certainly I'll speak for me, to get head down. Um, but that doesn't mean that you want to let your network grow cold. Um, and I think that you want to do your best. Yes, maybe you don't have the ability to grab a cup of coffee once a week or to you know, go out and grab a drink after work once a week, but do the best you can, not only to maintain your current network, but also sometimes as you get older, you may find the mentors and people that helped you early on have retired. They've you know, relocated, and so it's always important to try to keep that network you know, fresh where you can. And it does take, it's a two-way street. You know, I found with my network as I've tried to expand it, there's some folks that are busy on the other side and, and some will drift away. Try not to beat yourself up over it, but do the best you can to try to keep in touch with people. And even if it's just to say, hi, I'm here, how's it going? So that they know you're still thinking of them. And you know, that's my advice on networking. Yeah, your network is your net worth, right? Whether it's helping you to find your next gig uh, or whether it's to help find a next banking relationship, insurance relationship, what have you, it's important to maintain those contacts to some degree. Yeah, and you never really know when you're going to need that help so it doesn't hurt to keep in touch with people. And sometimes it's just fun. You know, it's nice to, again, get out of your normal mindset, just talk to someone and find out what's going on in their world, whether it's a banker, an insurance person, or a fellow CFO. Yeah. And the other thing I would say is if anyone's watching this that has let, let their network go cold, I had some advice from someone ages ago. Most people will still be willing to help you. So if it's someone where you're thinking, geez, I haven't talked to that person in 10 years. What are they going to think if I reach out to them now? Try it. The worst case is they don't answer. They say no. But most people can understand and be empathetic and understand that um, you know, your network can grow cold and they'll allow you to join again. Now, you don't want to cut them off a second time, but um, I think most people will always be willing to help. I know yeah, that's I the advice I share, too. I think people are basically decent and always willing to help. 
Yeah, everybody loves to give advice. Nobody likes to be asked for a job, but everybody loves to give advice. Absolutely. That's what I tell folks in transition. Um, in the limited time remaining here, you, you alluded to the mentorship and how mentors may retire or move on uh, out of your network. I'm going to give you an opportunity to put on your mentor hat here. Um, for the, the younger professionals who are watching here who aspire to become CFO, they're on that track. What are the things that you could share with them in terms of skills, resilience? What do they need to be best equipped to take on the role of the CFO? I think the most important thing is to get out from behind your desk. And I mean that both literally and figuratively. Um, it's very easy if you're a controller where you're even more chained to the numbers and closing the books to focus just on them. But even an effective controller is someone that is engaging and being a helper, whether it's to the general manager, the VP of sales, um, you know, a supply chain manager, whoever it is that they can work with. And it's not just a question of giving them the numbers and saying, well, you're over budget and then folding your hands across your chest like I'm the accountant and I'm the judge, jury, and executioner. It's, hey, Bob or Sally, I see the numbers are off. What can I do to help? What can we do together to try to bring this under control? Or if there's a legitimate need, I can bring that up to my boss, the CFO, and, and hopefully we can see if we can find those extra resources or money that you need. So engage people in other departments, learn the business. And, and certainly within the areas that I talked about, I think it's pretty common to um, be involved with IT and HR. So try to get more of an involvement in those areas. Be a people person um, and make sure you understand the systems, which hopefully in that role you kind of need to, because how are you going to crank the numbers if you don't know the systems? But understand it, order to cash, not just accounting. That sounds great. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I would love to continue this conversation. Hopefully, you'll consider coming back on the program again. Today, we were talking about the decisions and the challenges that businesses face from the lens of my guest, Glenn Hartenbaum, Chief Financial Officer from Gemini Bakery Equipment Company. My name is Dave Bookbinder. We'll see you again next time on Behind the Numbers.